Welcome to this podcast on digital responsibility. There's a vibrant community across the world at the moment driving forward corporate digital responsibility, which includes a range of aspects from digital ethics, digital for the environment, sustainability, digital well-being, inclusion, accessibility and more. This podcast talks to a number of people across that network to gain insight and, and learning to share across the world. My name is Rob Price, one of the founders of Corporate Digital Responsibility back in 2017. If you'd like to know more, have a look at the website, corporatedigitalresponsibility.net. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this, the sixth episode of the Corporate Digital Responsibility podcast. Today, Rob Price and I are joined on our podcast by Michael Waite. Michael, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hello. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm uh, Michael Wade, and I'm a professor of innovation and strategy at the IMD Business School based in Lausanne, Switzerland. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael. And uh, Michael, I mean, con- conscious that we spoke, um, well, kind of a couple of months ago now in terms of uh, for first conversation around CDR, but you've been, you've been working in this field as, at, well, as long, if not longer than, than both Christopher and I. So could you give listeners a bit of a background in terms of how you first came into uh, the field of corporate digital responsibility and, 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 and why you've kind of developed this passion for it? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, uh, my role uh, at, at IMD um, is, is largely around digital transformation, digitization, and looking at digital disruption. So I run a research center there and we have programs for, for executives that we offer on these topics. So I've been pretty deeply looking in, into digital disruption and transformation for about six years. And over that time, I, I, I've seen the whole field grow and mature. And at the same time, there's another field that's been growing and maturing kind of in a parallel track. And that's the whole topic of sustainability and ethics. And what's interesting and what struck me was that these, these two areas are, are massive and growing, but there's very few areas of intersection uh, between them. And I think we got to the point where it's inevitable that there's going to be uh, areas where, where, where these two you know, trends overlap. And, 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 so, and so I got interested in, in, in the idea of corporate digital responsibility and, and, uh, and, and you've been part of that journey as well, trying to understand what are those intersection points and what does it mean particularly for organizations? And that's how I got into the field. I think it's been one of the things that I've seen in, in my conversations over the last few months that a number of us approached it from those different angles. Uh, at Saskia, for example, in the conversations, her, her focus was very much sustainability on her route to this intersection, as, as to, to use the term uh, that you picked. Um, do, you, do you think I mean, one of the conversations I think we had last time was um, whether there needs to be a single unifying definition, if you like, of CDR? Uh, clearly, there's the work that you published previously. Uh, there's, there's a number of other organisations have given their perspectives. Are they close enough, do you think? Or, or does there still need to be some refinement about what we mean by CDR? I, I think there definitely needs to be some, some refinement. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that gets thrown in there uh, uh, today. But I do think it's useful to put an umbrella term uh, a, a around it. Um, I, I, I think that's because at the moment, um, it's dealt with in a very fragmented way within organizations, which is my focus, you know, how companies are dealing with it. So, you know, you've got privacy dealt with in one part of the organization. You've got cybersecurity dealt with in another part of the organization. You've got diversity inclusion dealt with somewhere else. You've got the economic value of information dealt with. So, so all these things are being managed and dealt with and thought about, but in a completely fragmented way. The, the different parts, they just don't talk to each other. And I think that's a problem. So putting an umbrella around it, I think, is helpful to indicate that there is synergies. There, there's areas of, of, of overlap here that need to be considered. Because if they're not, there's not only dangers that organizations can fall into, but there's also benefits that I think they're missing. Indeed. And um, I think the phrase CDR, um, emphasis on the R, just as in corporate social responsibility, helps an organization understand their responsibility from a societal perspective um, rather than delving into 
and perhaps their own ethics as a business it, it very much is, puts the emphasis on on what that their represent what their responsibility looks like outwardly to the rest of the world and how they interlink with other organizations whether they be private public sector in nature and um, so i i agree that um the, the definition needs refinement but um it will hopefully help it uh, overcome that next barrier, which is for CDR to be picked up in the mainstream for the, the end citizen to feel that organizations have a corporate digital responsibility to them personally and at scale to, to behave in this way. Uh, I was wondering, Michael, um, do you see any examples today of the mainstream, um, the citizen picking up this topic? Um, and, and how do you think that that's going to work in the next few years? I, I think we're going to see more and more of that. Um, you know, there's there's been there's been a period of time when when uh, this topic is dealt with in 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 many cases as a compliance question. Mm -hmm. So corporate digital compliance rather than corporate digital responsibility, two very, very different things. You know, doing something because you have to do or do something because it's a responsible thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that trend will accelerate as civil society, as you talk about it, become more aware and start caring more about that, mm -hmm. right? You kind of have on the, on the sustainability side, you have the, the Greta Thunberg effect, right? Where, where actually pressure is starting to come from civil society now for organizations to change their, change their practices around sustainability. Mm -hmm. And I think probably the same thing will happen. I hope the same thing will happen when it comes to digital ethics and areas around digital responsibility, as, as you know, consumers become more concerned about how their data is being is being used by the organizations that they that they work with. I think one of the things that um, we'll also see, and I had this conversation actually uh, with uh, with an organization in a, in a European country talking about. Uh, badges effectively so so how do you give the consumer clarity about an organization's um uh, the, well a responsibility to kind of use use the word earlier just how do they perform around ethical use of data or or privacy or or, or the these topics so one thing to actually kind of measure it i guess and another thing to uh, then drive enough consumer awareness that that's something to look out for. But I think there's this kind of, I mean, there is the shift that we've talked about in terms of generational purpose, strength of purpose within organisations, driving people's affinity to want to buy from them, to work for them. Um, and, and I think maybe there's something that also comes out of this pandemic around that as well, people wanting to better connect with society and community and purpose as we rebuild. Um, are there, are there, what, what, what's the best that you, I mean, there, I know that you've been talking to uh, other people and organisations over the past few months. What, what, what have you seen out there that excites you uh, in, in this space? Who's doing some amazing things? Well, it's not that easy to find organisations that are really doing amazing things. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a disconnect at the moment between principles and practice. Right. So there's there's no shortage of principles out there around AI ethics or or digital ethics or whatever, digital sustainability, whatever. There's all kinds of principles. There's assessments. There's all kinds of stuff out there. But when it comes down to how to actually um, execute that in practice, I think there's a big disconnect. Organizations are struggling. Uh, so you may have principles at the high level, but how does that filter down to somebody who's making a decision about where to locate a new, uh, a, a new location or what voice to use in, a, in an advertising campaign or which you know, uh, organization to, to, to work collaboratively with? I'm not sure it's really filtering down to that level because that's, that's hard. That means you've got to Think all the way through the organizational context. You've got to filter it down. You've got to have checks and balances. And I don't see too many companies that are taken down to that level. There's quite a few companies that have, you know, a board of digital ethics uh, or a council or even a chief digital ethics officer or something like that. Probably the, the, the best example, and I can use the example because they're quite open about it, is, is MasterCard. Uh, MasterCard have really, have really pushed the envelope a long way. Uh, on, on this question. So they, they have a very high level 
principle around decency. They, they really want to do, de but, but, they've, but they've taken this concept of decency and, and translated it into, into quite concrete actions um, uh, where their, their principles have become filters so that key decisions that are being made in the organization have to go through this filter before they're approved. And I think unless you get to that level, uh, it's, it's, it's not really going to make tangible change. It just becomes kind of a cool thing to say you're doing, but you're not really changing the organization. And that, that's, that, that idea of filtering decision-making um, is interesting because in many scenarios, the, the action of CDR and when it comes to fruition will come about when a, co a company doesn't make a decision, i.e. chooses to go down a different path than using somebody's data for certain purposes or sending out a project that is a bit exclusive of certain generations in society or choosing not to automate um, half of your workforce because you want to favor human productivity and employment. Um, so it might be those boardroom decisions that a company chooses not to make because of those filters that um, are the greatest examples of, of companies taking this seriously. Um, which is interesting. I suppose when you look at it, we are talking about a world that in a Western society, for example, we have known economic capitalist principles driving organisations, shareholder economies. That's the world we know. That's my career. Uh, that's the operating model. The, 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 the whole, everything that is measured is, is, is that, that's the experience of the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And, and this... This is challenging some aspects of that because in a sense it's saying it isn't just about profitability. There are some other things that are as important, equally important. Um, and, and, and there's plenty of reports that kind of, that you, you can see that being discussed, but turning that into changed behaviors, changed operating models or governance, different reports to the shareholders. I, get, I guess it's just as simple as change takes time. The question is, can we afford the time? And therefore, does there need to be an accelerant of that to create more immediate results? What, if, if, not, um, if not some amazing things, are there things, some, some areas that, of hope that you would point to in terms of some of the conversations that you're having that maybe can uh, you can see developing into and gaining momentum to help kind of drive that change? Well, I think, I think there's, a, there's a lot more awareness now and that, that awareness is, is broadly understood in, in organizations. You know, it's not just a niche topic anymore, uh, digital ethics and responsibility and corporate digital responsibility. It's, you know, when, when, when I, I think the two of you and I started looking at this, it was really very few people had heard about it. They weren't even sure what it was, but I think now it's becoming a lot more of a commonly used term and, and commonly discussed in organizations. And I think so awareness is the first step. Um, uh, of course, even today, if, if, if you really want to get the attention of a management team on this topic, you know, you talk about the risks uh, because risks, you know, a, a cyber attack or a, or a big GDPR fine, you know, that's going to get people's attention. But that's, that's unfortunate that it has to be that way. And, and I think it's really important to, to look at the, the, the opportunity side and not just the risk side. And once that opportunity side is better understood, then I think it's going to accelerate a lot, a, lot more, a lot more quickly. And so we need some good examples. We need some good case examples of companies that have taken forward thinking approaches to digital ethics and responsibility have seen benefits and gains in their performance. And once we see that and that gets kind of popularized, I think we're gonna see a, 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 an acceleration within organizations around this topic. Uh, I, I definitely agree. I think, I mean, I, one of the conversations I had last year was in regards to the use of data within organizations. I think um, there was an eight Harvard Business Review report that talked about um, defensive and offensive data strategies. Um, and everyone gets stuck on the defensive piece, as you say, risks, uh, making sure that it is compliant. 
uh, everyone knows increasingly that uh, it's wrong to be too offensive uh, in, in, in that sense. But finding that middle ground of how do you create value from that information to benefit people, everybody, citizens, uh, I, I, think, I think is the, the, the harder piece. I think that goes back to the heart of the question about who is responsible within boards, uh, because it's everybody, it's therefore nobody, because everybody has their focus on what the things are that they need to fix. And this is all encompassing, if you like. Um, uh, uh, perhaps that goes back to your earlier point of the, the, the need for uh, not necessarily just digital ethics boards or, or heads of, but actually somebody responsible for, um, well, I don't want to say CDR, but something, somebody responsible for the breadth of decency and uh, awareness of making progress from an overall ethics, from an overall uh, sustainability planet, etc. I don't know what the answer is yet. Any any thoughts? Well, I think it's 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 unrealistic to to believe that you could have a single person who has um, true oversight. Well, oversight maybe is possible, but but control over everything to do with. With, with corporate digital responsibility because it touches so many areas. And, and, and so, you know, you're not going to be able to take power away from, you know, the lines of business or the IT department, or the legal department uh, or the HR department all have a stake in this. But, but I do think it's worthwhile um, somebody taking a, a coordinating role and a facilitating role, somebody who can um, take an inventory of all digital practices through an organization so a, a sort of collective view, a high level view of all the different practices that are happening and then see where there's gaps, see where there's where is overlap, see where there's inconsistencies and then work with those departments to help resolve those. And, and maybe not so much with the stick, that's pretty hard, but with, but with a carrot. So coming in with resources to help those parts of the organization to improve their practices with, with suggestions, with funding, if necessary, so that there's kind of a, a proactive approach on the positive side rather than just you've got to stop doing this because it's wrong. I, I also think whoever's, whoever's running this, whoever, whoever's facilitating this needs to have a, a very close relationship with some key stakeholders, uh, including the a chief digital officer, if there is one, uh, uh, the um, chief privacy officer, is, if there is one, a chief information security officer, if there is one, chief operating officer, in many cases. Uh, and, and maybe other key commercial leaders. So I, I think there needs to it needs to be a it needs to be a team effort uh, at the top to make this happen. Maybe it's time for a recasting of the CDO in in the sense that often people talked about chief digital officer as a transitory role. It was somebody there to drive a change, but it wasn't the ongoing BAU. I think the answer to many of the conversations that I've had about this is it is the CEO. That's where responsibility lies. It comes back to it is everything. Um, but the CEO therefore needs somebody to be that advisor, helper, guider, uh, who's got that breadth of understanding. So, so, so maybe we reinvent the CEO. Um, Christopher, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking as we're going through this that a lot of these applications of CDR to decision making and to change are likely to come about um, most intrinsically through kind of business operating model change. Um, We've seen the huge transition to the platform economy recently, where so many of the largest companies in the world are platform based. And the makeup and structure of those organizations is so substantially different to uh, the previous industry 3.0, however you refer to them, mode of running a business, that perhaps we should see that redefinition of a CDO role and um, indeed the CEO in that context, is being part of that broader um, business operating shift. Because if you are going to um, encourage automation of the workforce in the right way, if you are going to manage how you utilize customers' data, if you're going to do all of those things, it's probably going to be alongside a strategic shift of an organization. Um, and we shouldn't see the two as separate. Maybe we should, should see the two as intertwined with each other. I think that's a, that, that's a very important point because you can spend a lot of time and effort and resources to get your own house in order, 
but you live in a village. So it's not just you, right? You're dealing with some of these big platforms. Uh, you can't avoid them these days. You're working with big platforms. You have suppliers, you have customers, you have channel partners. Uh, and, and so even if you're doing a good job, you know, the fault could lie somewhere else and it could still have a negative impact on you. So absolutely, there's the, the, the ecosystem uh, uh, risks and, and opportunities are definitely there, right? That's, uh, uh, there's, there's no question. And that's why it helps, I think, when you have an, you know, in an industry, you have an anchor player, maybe a very, very big player in the industry like Walmart, you see, in, you know, in, in retail, physical retail in the U.S., such a powerful player in its ecosystem that it can somehow uh, uh, influence these practices throughout the value chain or Amazon, maybe, or Google. It's almost the operating system owner, isn't it? One day it's the, the person that own, owns a platform that encourages when I send out an email for the, the photos to have a, a, a description or an audio description for the, the, the person who needs accessibility to that data. If Microsoft lead on that charge, then so many organizations, it bleeds through. I think one of the things that we talked about has also been uh, voluntary adoption versus regulatory and compliance. And there are a number of changes really around the world, um, but certainly kind of UK and Europe that are happening this year. Um, we've, we've seen kind of guidance in the UK around um, appropriate use of, of AI and, and, and data. Uh, in Europe, we've got the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act uh, arriving this, this, this year. Do you, th do you think they'll have an impact? Kind of how, how do you see them as again, going back to the idea of accelerating some of the movement in, in the European market, at least? It's very, very hard to say. Uh, if, if the legislation is, is written well, if it's clearly articulated, uh, then it could, ha they could, could have an impact. But, but you, you'll recall GDPR that came in with you know, a lot of teeth and, and people were very worried at, at, at the beginning. And then kind of nothing happened and, and very, very few organizations have, have really been, um, have, have, have been taken to task on that. So I think people stopped worrying about it that much. So I think it really depends on enforcement uh, and well, how well the, that legislation is written, how well it's communicated and how well it's enforced. If all those things are done well, then it could have a, a you know, relatively large, a large impact, hopefully for the positive. Cool. Um, conscious of time and, uh, and brilliant conversation um, so far. I guess we started off the conversation just by uh, uh, talking a bit about the pandemic and the impact it's had on everybody's lives over the last, well, year, unbelievably, uh, now. Um, how do you uh, uh, see the next kind of six, six, 12 months from a, from a CDR point of view? Um, because clearly it's going to be months yet before we do return to uh, meeting people, socially kind of interacting, going to offices on any sort of scale. Um, any, any other turns in the road from a CDR perspective in terms of people thinking differently, do you think? Well, I think it, it could very well accelerate CDR. Uh, it's certainly accelerating digital transformation. Uh, because we just don't have the option to interact uh, physically as we did in the past. So, so many more of our interactions are, are digitally mediated, which brings up the question of, of how is all our data being used? And, and, and so I think some of these questions are coming up more often than, than they were before. So I would not be surprised if we, if, if, if we see acceler an acceleration of, of the topic of digital ethics and, and, and the responsible use of, of, of data and it becoming more of a front burner kind of uh, question and discussion for, for organizations moving forward. I certainly hope, I do hope that that's the case. Uh, there are some indications that, that organizations are starting to turn their attention to that as they're moving away from the crisis of, of dealing with the pandemic. Um, so let, let's see, the, the, the next six months will We'll, we'll uncover a lot, a lot of that for us, but, uh, but I would very much like to see this becoming more of a, uh, more of a real uh, uh, issue and concern for organizations. And, and as we talked about earlier, an, an acceleration of the movement from principles to practice. 
absolutely. Um, let's see where where everything lands after all this is um, after we move on from this current world. Um, thank you for your time, Michael, on, on the podcast. It's much appreciated. I'm, I'm sure our research will see our paths intertwine again in the future um, and looking forward to that occurring. I was just going to say it's, it's, it's my pleasure to join the podcast and, uh, you know, I encourage all listeners to, to, uh, to stay tuned and, and, and keep, uh, keep, keep on track and trying to figure out uh, with us, you know, where the future is going with corporate digital responsibility.